Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a special show, Fraud in Agriculture. We'll meet a man who spent three decades investigating for the USDA. In one case, a young man goes to jail, convicted of cheating a federal program. And before we're completely out of the season, how do you preserve those poinsettias for next year? Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Amy Myers. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for joining us today for Farm Week. Well, let's get right to it. A special theme for our show today, fraud in agriculture. In our first piece, we meet Don Doles, who gives us unusual insight into the darker side of the ag world. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz. In early 2005, a data analytics center hired by the federal government contacted investigator Don Doles with some unusual findings. Doles never suspected the information would kick off the biggest case of his career. Within months, Doles would be placing hidden cameras and rushing for his pistol to save his life. Doles wasn't an ATF or FBI agent. He was in a job most might assume is a bit less traumatic. Agricultural investigator with the USDA Office of Inspector General. The information given to Doles sent him after a North Carolina crop insurance agent and a network of more than 50 people who had defrauded the federal crop insurance program of an estimated $100 million. They don't play. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money. So... Uh, farmers, uh, especially these organized groups, don't take well to local people turning them in. And so they, they can get by. Yeah, I've had contracts out on me before. Doles, who retired after 29 years of agricultural investigative work, estimates the percentage of USDA cases involving wrongdoing is in line with those of other federal programs. Most farmers are or honest people, and, and they just want to be left alone. Funny thing is that very little farming goes on without some sort of federal involvement now. And most of them try to do right. Market to Market analyzed data from the annual reports of the USDA Office of Inspector General and found a rough relationship between a drop in net farm income and an increase in the number of federal investigations and convictions. By 2002, net farm income had dipped to the lowest point since the 1980s farm crisis. Within a few years, Doles and other investigators would be on the tail of Robert Carl Stokes, a Wilson, North Carolina crop insurance agent. Stokes had brought together a group of area farmers who underreported their harvest to the government and quietly sold the hidden portions to complicit buyers. Stokes's company, the Hallmark Agency, came to the attention of federal investigators after number crunchers noticed an unusually high frequency of payouts. Doles called a friend at the Risk Management Agency, which oversees privately contracted federal crop insurance, and asked what he knew about Hallmark. His RMA contact said a man had reached out to him just the day before, saying he had information to share. The next day I called a plane, flew up and met with him in the parking lot of a church, and he laid out the, what was going on, and it was dead on. He provided us with 10 names of farmers he knew were involved and we went back and pulled the records, and sure enough, it was clear that they were cheating the program. Understanding the dangers of going undercover, the man hesitated to get more deeply involved. He felt he was in danger because there were so many farmers that were involved. It turned out that the 10 or so names he gave us was just the tip of the iceberg. A Wilson area farmer who was unaware of the insurance fraud scheme at the time, believes the man's fears were justified. 
I would hate to think I had to rat on a neighbor. That's why I don't like to know anything at all because it's a good way to wake up dead one morning. <laughs> By 2006, the man had changed his mind and agreed to work undercover. Doles and his team then asked the informant to infiltrate Stokes's crop insurance crew. We would put a microphone and a small recorder in his pocket and uh, later on we used a camera. Looks like a button. Well, he went down to the place called Liberty Warehouse and the owner there said, yeah, I'll provide you with these false invoices for your tobacco sales, but you gotta pay me. For Doles and a fellow investigator, one arrest took a sudden violent turn. Well, we got there and he took off for the for his cab of his truck. When well, I'm right behind him and uh, we get to the truck cab and he's reaching into the center console. When he did, I put the pistol up back of his ear and I said, if you reach in there, I'll kill you right where you sit. Shortly after Stokes' arrest, the informant died of natural causes. Never knowing the web of convictions would involve 57 people in multiple states. In order to carry it out, it required people willing to break the law at a number of levels. Stokes, who served nearly two years in prison, lost his home and his insurance business. He died in 2016. While Stokes' wife didn't defend his actions, she did say local farmers weren't a bunch of lambs being led to the slaughter. Todd Glover, a Wilson farmer, was surprised about some of the producers who were involved. The farmers were struggling to, to, to make money and, and, and things was really tight back then, like they are today. And I think that caused some people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. Every farmer in every county where this occurred, whether they know it or not, uh, was victimized because their insurance premiums went up. Honest farmers were screaming, yo, you got to do something. You got to stop this. They're killing us. They're, they're running the rent up on us, and we can't stay in the business. A quick gardening story before we get too far past the holidays. Have you wondered if your Christmas poinsettia can be saved for later? Here's Gary Bachman with the answer. Many of us had a beautiful poinsettia for the Christmas holidays. These gorgeous plants can certainly brighten a dreary weather-wise part of the year. Now what? Do you keep it or toss it? Let me share some tips for enjoying your poinsettia year round. First, put your poinsettia in a warm, sunny window and water normally. As far as temperature is concerned, if you're comfortable, your poinsettia will be too. Temperatures below 60 degrees can cause leaf drop. Remember, these are tropical plants native to Mexico. In spring, start decreasing watering and allow to dry out a bit. Cut the stems back to about four inches, don't worry it will grow back, and repot into a bigger container. When night temps stay above 60 degrees, move outside. The poinsettia will love your porch or patio. Remember to water and fertilize as needed. Prune the stems back one to two inches a couple of times during the summer to promote bushier growth. When night temperatures start hitting 60 in the fall, bring the plant back inside. Now comes the fun part. Can you make your poinsettia bloom for Christmas? Beginning October 1st, use a box to cover and keep your plant in total darkness for 14 continuous hours every day for at least six weeks. There's no guarantee, but hopefully it will be ready for Christmas. If not, I will guarantee there'll be plenty of colorful poinsettias to pick up at your local garden center to enjoy. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We return to the theme of this edition of Farm Week, agricultural fraud. Sometimes that fraud is unintentional, perhaps just a matter of interpretation of some complex agricultural law. Once again, here's Colleen Bradford-Krantz. 
For months in 2009, Lenny Peterson farmed around a washout that had developed in his Lemoore, North Dakota cornfield. But when his son got the sprayer stuck in the two-foot-deep gully that summer, Peterson asked permission of the local Natural Resources Conservation Service to smooth the edges. Peterson said he was told the edges could be smoothed as long as the washout's original depth didn't change. A local NRCS representative stopped by the Peterson farm to check their progress. The official would later disagree in court about the message he delivered that day. I asked him if we could go finish, and he goes, as I said, I saw you doing nothing wrong. So they went out and finished, and then, of course, the people who turned us in, they heard about this, so they called the state. <laughs> That's when the fun began. <laughs> Peterson is referring to the six-year legal battle which followed the arrival of a letter that fall, accusing Peterson and his wife Patty of swamp busting, or improperly draining a wetland. Swamp busters are ineligible for farm program payments. The Petersons would ultimately tie up nearly half a million dollars in the battle and face more than one sleepless night. It's quite a hair-pulling ordeal to go through. It's a good thing, $7 corn. All my neighbors were buying land, tractors, and machinery. I was paying lawyers. <laughs> and the water would come in right down. NRCS officials came to the Peterson farm in December 2009 to determine whether he had violated the swamp buster rule. Peterson found agents digging holes in their recently seeded winter wheat. Worried about his crop, he asked the NRCS officials to leave. And that was a mistake then, too. Then I got another big certified letter from FSA to pay back all this money. To get the government payments, you have to sign a form that allows them access to your field 24-7, 365 days a year. He soon found himself sitting before the Lemoore County Farm Service Agency Committee, a group made up of his fellow producers. The committee voted to restore Peterson's eligibility for farm program benefits in early 2010, but was overruled by the state FSA office a month later. Additional appeals and government decisions went against the Petersons. After losing at lower administrative levels, the Petersons decided to skip directly to the National Appeals Division. As decisions in 2011 and 12 failed to go their way, the Petersons were becoming overwhelmed with legal fees and repayment of tens of thousands of dollars in past crop subsidy payments. Lenny and Patty hit a low point and debated selling the farm. <laughs> there were a lot of conversations. They were kind of one-sided. They were her conversations about giving up, about me being bullheaded, me being stubborn. Are you? Oh, yeah. In 2013, the Petersons sued the NRCS, and the case was eventually heard in Fargo. A few weeks after the hearing, Lenny Peterson was in the field when his lawyer called to tell him the judge's ruling. We're combining beans, me and my wife will never forget that. And phone rang and I got told it. And <laughs> well, I just grabbed the radio and told her we're going to go out and get bleeping drunk tonight. And, and uh, yeah, it was really good, really good news. Despite winning the day, the ordeal was far from over. The Petersons struggled for weeks to get the government to return the lost subsidies. They were also soon notified that the NRCS had pushed the case to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis. But in early 2015, the NRCS dismissed the appeal just before the court date. If they took it to the Eighth Circuit and lost, this ruling would have went for all the states in the Eighth Circuit. In the meantime, Mary Podol had taken over as North Dakota's state conservationist. So my first day on the job here in North Dakota was meeting producers in the Red River and uh, the eastern part of North Dakota who were angry and frustrated. Everything was being appealed, and a lot of things were being managed through lawyers. 
Once the dust had settled, Podol stopped by the Peterson farm. He really got the feeling it had become personal to some, some people, and I don't disagree with that. There were some within the agency that had just kind of taken on a whole anti-farmer, if you drain, if, if you manipulate wetlands, you're just bad, and that's not our place. That's not our role to judge. Yeah, I was a little leery at first talking to her. We had quite interesting talks, and uh, I give her a lot of credit, and I thanked her for stopping here and listening. By 2013, the agency had reorganized compliance teams nationwide, and Podol pushed North Dakota's NRCS officials to bring an open mind to their farm visits. It was more, that's a farmer, oh my goodness, you know, they're going to come in and they're complaining. You listen to a farmer and they say, I farmed this for 30 years, and you can honestly say, you know, I can see what you're saying here. The Petersons were eventually repaid most of the money they had tied up in the battle with USDA. I had to go to a meeting in uh, way up northwest North Dakota and tell about this whole deal. And one guy in the crowd said, so it paid to be bullheaded and stubborn. And I said, no, it still cost me 150000 so it didn't pay. <laughs> I won. I got my point across. And that was the main thing. It was the principle. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our final Farm Week feature, we continue our fraud and agriculture theme. We'll meet a young rancher who had the best of intentions, but the pressures of maintaining his overhead led him to compromise a federal loan program. He wound up in prison over the matter. Now that he's out of jail, he says he'd do things differently, but that the government should play a different role too. Coming up on Farm Week. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before part three of our Fraud in Agriculture show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, January 29th and 30th at the Lake Terrace Convention Center in Hattiesburg, it's the Mississippi Peanut Growers Association 14th Annual Meeting and Trade Show. The MPGA is organized and operated for educational and scientific purposes. For more information about the conference, call Dr. Malcolm Broom at 601-606-3547. And on February 5th and 6th at the Boss Extension Center at Mississippi State University in Starkville, it's the 46th Annual Mississippi Agricultural Consultants Conference. The conference begins at 8 a.m. on the 5th, and your registration fee includes lunch. License renewal is available at the conference. The fee is $80 at the door. You can register for $65 online until January 28th. For more information, visit online at msagconsultants.com. Sometimes fraud happens more as a matter of circumstance, especially when farmers and ranchers are behind, as they often are these days, the revenue eight ball. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz with our final feature on justice in agriculture. Joey Nelson was on top of the world when the first big loads of cattle arrived at his new Bramer, Missouri feedlot in 2013. The 19-year-old had a government loan and was anxious to grow his operation. Nelson's supplier, Iowa-based Cyclone Cattle Company, was purchasing truckloads of cattle from drought-stricken southern states and sending them to Nelson as well as others. It was only a short time, however, before Nelson was overwhelmed. They thought that they were going to get rich off of this, and they didn't have a place to go with them. So they just kept sending them here. Everything works until you run out of grass or feed or money. <laughs> One of the three. Run out of grass first, so you know you went to feeding more, and then the feed bills get bigger than the bill they want to pay, and then you run out of money. By then, the young farmer was trying to feed nearly 800 steers and cows as Missouri faced a drought of its own. Nelson's debt grew to nearly $300,000.
That's when Nelson made the mistakes that would land him in federal prison. He sold some of his own cattle without notifying FSA, a requirement when livestock is tied to farm loans, and failed to ask the sale barns to list the agency on the checks. Nelson knew he was violating the rules, but moved ahead, hoping to avoid a months long delay that might follow a request to the federal government. I figured I had done something wrong by not going through the proper channel to sell the cattle. I mean, you run out of operating money, and if you want to keep the cattle alive, you're going to sell something to feed them to pay the feed bills. Court documents suggest that Nelson deliberately hid the sales by having checks written out using a different version of his name than is on his FSA loans. Some checks also were made out to a friend, the money later transferred to Nelson's bank account. I'm not going to say that I didn't sell some of the cattle that were on my loan note, because we did. But we didn't sell them to, you know, go buy a trip to Hawaii or anything like that. Occasionally, farmers who cheat federal programs or mislead consumers are accused of using the profits for purchases the government would describe as being for personal enjoyment and pleasure. In 2016, for example, an Idaho farmer was sentenced to three years in prison for selling regular alfalfa seed as organic. Court documents say he used the profits to buy an RV and a boat. Dr. Michael Roseman, an Iowa-based psychologist, says that more often than not, producers who get in trouble with USDA made decisions that were intended to keep their farm or ranch financially viable. Often, there is a misconception that farmers deliberately undertake uh, fraud, or if they do, only to make money, but that's not the main reason. I think the main reason is that farmers want to get ahead, and they may have made mistakes, and they can't bear to own up to them because it is an admission of weakness. In rare cases, some psychologists believe, those farmers who were charged have committed suicide to either avoid serving time in prison or facing the public shame. Roseman says the data shows a shift away from older producers taking their lives. Now we're seeing younger farmers from age 45 up to their late 60s as the most vulnerable for self-harm. And we're trying to figure out why that is. Possibly it has something to do with uh, a sense that I only have a few more years uh, to succeed, and it's make or break time. Before Joey Nelson knew it, he was standing before a federal judge in Kansas City, being sentenced to two years in the U.S. penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas. He said when he gave me the 24 months that he was making an example out of me to the agricultural community. And I thought, boy, some example. You guys advertise your loans very hard. And this is what will happen if something goes wrong. Nelson, now 24, believes FSA loans are not only important, but critical to keeping American farmers in business. He does wonder, however, if young farmers with loans should have a greater degree of oversight and guidance. I thought, well, at the worst case scenario, I've done something that I broke a rule in a loan. Didn't commit a crime. I didn't, you know, go out and rob a bank or anything like that. I mean, I broke a contract. Well, not when it's federal. You, it, you've committed some sort of fraud. They said that I'd set out from day one to do this. Well, I can tell you from day one, I didn't know what I was doing. The parent company of Cyclone Cattle Company, the Iowa feedlot that had been sending Nelson loads of cattle in 2014, filed for bankruptcy in April of 2018. Although he spent 13 months in Leavenworth Camp, a minimum security satellite facility, the time there still convinced Nelson to always dot his I's and cross his T's. Just imagine being ripped out of everything you've known and thrown into a complete and total different place. You go from working 12 and 13 hour days to sitting around. Your world just comes to a stop. 
know, they, they let you out early if you got a drug case because you got a problem. And well, I got an addiction too, I guess. Gambling, it's a gambling addiction to plain farming. And you know, they didn't offer a treatment course for that. Nelson was released in March of 2018 and is trying to move on with his life. He now farms with his mother, who has had her own operation for decades. Nelson says he has learned some lessons the hard way. Anybody that's young that wants to get bigger, you know, it's faster is always the better way. Well, not necessarily. It can catch up with you. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Looks like that young man learned a valuable lesson. Absolutely too bad he had to go to federal prison, though, to, to learn that lesson. Now, next week on Farm Week, young people with a more benevolent side. It's an unusual story about a nonprofit grocery store, a store that's a joint project between a small town in Cody, Nebraska, and a school district. The students are the only paid employees, and they get class credit. This business model is sustainable in a people-centric way. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you ever miss a story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week on our website, farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.